Okay. Um, welcome to Tuesday Topics. I'm Vicki Arnett, current president of the League of Women Voters of Topeka. Um, I want to remind everybody, because we're going to talk about redistricting today, that uh, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization which does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. Uh, the League of Women Voters does, however, take positions on current issues. And one of the current positions that we have taken is about redistricting. Um, so our speaker today is Dr. Grant Armstrong. Uh, Dr. Armstrong joined the Washburn Political Science Department in August 2020 upon completing his PhD at the University of Mississippi. His primary focus is American politics. More specifically, he studies public opinion, political psychology, and political behavior. Dr. Armstrong is also assisting in updating the public administration major at Washburn. Um, so, Dr. Armstrong, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, first, I want to thank you all for having me here today and giving me the opportunity to speak a little bit about redistricting. Um, so, with that said, let's go ahead and get started. So here's a general outline of where this talk will go today. Um, we'll begin with a general view of redistricting, kind of cover the basics. Um, then we'll look at redistricting at the state level. So we'll take a little deeper look at redistricting on some court cases um, regarding redistricting of the state. Then we will look at gerrymandering, uh, where that word came from. Um, and that's one of the more negative effects or consequences of redistricting. And we'll look at partisan, also known as political uh, gerrymandering and also racial gerrymandering. And then we'll shift our focus to Kansas specifically. And we will look at the outcome of the most recent elections and also highlight some of the possible ramifications from those elections. And then we'll kind of lay out some possible solutions um, to the redistricting problems we currently have in our state. Um, and at any time during this, this talk, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, we don't have to hold questions till the end. So if there's something you're really eager to ask, uh, please don't hesitate. All right, so simply put, right, redistricting that occurs every 10 years um, upon completion of the census, right, and we redraw districts based on population, right, and this occurs um, for representation in Congress, right, in the House of Representatives, and also representation in state legislatures, uh, whether we're talking about the House or the Senate, um, unless you're the weird state of Nebraska that only has one legislative uh, um, chamber. So the court has ruled that states must draw districts as equally as possible. So when a state is designating congressional districts, right, they have to make them as equal as possible, right? So you can't have one district with say 200,000 people and then another district with a million people, right? That's not fair. So they have to be as close as possible to being equal. Um, and as you'll see, that court case um, that established that was from 1964, a lot of the court cases that deal with redistricting and representation uh, occurred in the early 1960s and mid 1960s, right? And there was a uh, really seminal court case uh, in 2016, where the court, the Supreme Court, established that districts have to be drawn to include everybody that's living there not just people that are of voting age population. So that's what VAP stands for, voting age population. So this will probably also include, could include, people that are not in the country um, with proper documentation. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with um, the fact that when Donald Trump was president, he wanted to have a question on the census, right, about people's legal stats. And the Supreme Court struck that down and said he couldn't include it. Um, but then Trump said that he would rely on outside sources to try to exclude um, people that are not in the country legally 
uh, from being included in terms of representation, right? But that's really important um, note there that it's everybody there, right? Kids, um, legal residents, people that can't vote, and also people that can vote. So then if we look at the, at the state level, right, there was a uh, court case in 1962 called Baker versus Carr. And this is where the Supreme Court kind of established um, their authority in terms of being able to make rulings on the issue of redistricting. So in Gray versus Sanders, um, you had a case where um, states were giving representation at the state legislature in the Senate based on county. So really rural counties were having the same representation as really urban counties. So it wasn't depending on population. It was kind of just this idea that we're going to treat counties almost like states. And the court said, no, you can't do that because you're treating people unfairly. So follow-up case, Reynolds versus Sims, the court basically said that that one person, one vote applies to states as well. So this is the case for the House and the Senate, right? Both chambers. So we think about the United States uh, Congress, right? Senate is not based on population, right? Every state has two senators. That's not the case, the state legislature. Um, and that's what was established um, with Reynolds versus Senate. So again, it's this, this concept of one person, one vote, um, that's been very important since, again, the, the early 60s. So, right, one of the negative effects, one of the darker sides of redistricting is gerrymandering. Right, so we get that term from um, a guy, a gentleman, who was governor of Maryland by the name of um, Eldridge Jerry. And he, as governor, approved a congressional map, legislative districts, that um, looked what you, you know, like what you see up there on the top, that first picture here, right? So a really funky looking district that no reasonable person um, would draw unless they had some kind of political considerations in mind, right? And some people said it looked like a salamander. To me, it looks more like some kind of vicious looking dragon than a salamander, um, but thus the name Jerry Mander, right? Just combining his name with the salamander. Right. And all this process means is that some group in power is going to draw legislative districts to benefit one group at the expense of another. Right. So this can uh, be done to benefit a political group, um, a racial group, um, any group like that. So, you know, we see this quite often, people trying to consolidate their power one party over the other. Um, and, right, partisan gerrymandering, right, has been upheld as constitutional. Um, states are free to do this. Um, this was a ruling the Supreme Court made in 2019. However, the court also said that although they can't make a decision on this, that states themselves can limit partisan gerrymandering. They can do stuff to restrict it. Um, but it's kind of an odd ruling because you think back to the court case that I mentioned, Baker versus Carr in 1962, the Supreme Court said that redistricting was something that the federal courts could consider. But in 2019, this is more of a conservative court um, and a very conservative ruling. And they said, hey, we're going to punt it back to the states. Right? So if we want to see what the product of partisan gerrymandering looks like, we can just take a look at North Carolina down here, right? So the first map you see there of the state of North Carolina was the Republican congressional map. This is what the Republicans came up with. They gave themselves 10 seats, Democrats three. Now the second version of the state um, is a hypothetical of what Democrats would have done if they would have engaged in partisan gerrymandering. Right, they would have drawn it to benefit themselves. So it would have been nine to four, um, almost a complete shift, but the same number of votes. Right? And then if you look at the hypothetical nonpartisan map, 
you see that that's the most equal, right? Five, five, and then you would actually have three true swing districts compared to the other two where you have no swing districts, right? So in my opinion, the last makes the most sense, but that's not what we get when we allow partisan gerrymandering uh, to take hold. Now, racial gerrymandering, on the other hand, is not constitutional. Um, so this was first established in the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Um, and again, the 60s, and we saw a lot of progress in terms of representation and also uh, racial justice. Uh, so the Voting Rights Act forbid racial gerrymandering. So you cannot you know, draw districts to disenfranchise certain minority groups or any racial group for that matter. And this was reaffirmed by the courts, the Supreme Court in Miller versus Johnson. Right, so right now, you know, courts are gonna be very, very skeptical and highly suspicious of any district that appears to be drawn to disenfranchise certain minority groups. So what does it look like in Kansas? Um, and I'm sure that you all are much more familiar with this than I am. Um, Kansas has only been my home for about seven months now. Um, so I'm still pretty new, um, but I do consider Kansas my home at this point. So the Kansas, uh, the, the Kansas districts, both congressionally and the state level, right, they're drawn by state legislatures. Right? Uh, this is actually the case in most states. The majority of states allow state legislatures to draw the districts as they see fit. Um, and I'm sure that you all are familiar with the case of 2012 when the legislature could not agree on districts um, and a federal judge, a U.S. district judge, had to actually draw the districts and force that upon uh, Kansas. So it's kind of interesting. Um, now, redrawing the maps, whether it's um, congressional uh, representation, so I know Kansas has four, right, or whether it's uh, legislative districts for the House or the Senate, those are both subject to a veto by the governor. And in the case of legislative districts, but not congressional districts, those have to be looked at and approved by the Kansas State Supreme Court. Um, and again, that's not the way uh, that every state does it, but that's at least the system that we have set up here in Kansas. So what happens with the 2020 election here? Well, the Republicans managed to pick up two seats in the state house. So they increased from 84 to 86. Um, and the Senate stayed the same, 29 to 11. So they didn't pick up any seats. But the key thing for them is that the Democrats made no gains. So Republicans were able to maintain their supermajority, right, which basically makes them veto-proof. They have the ability to override the governor's veto, and in this case, particularly when it comes to redrawing districts. Um, so this certainly gives Democrats an advantage in the state where the state legislature draws the district. Right, and this is another thing that I'm sure everybody is familiar with, right? But the one Democratic congressional district we have, right, is the smallest over here, right? Congressional District 3. So what could happen because of those election results um, in November? Well, right, simply Republicans basically are in the driver's seat. They have a lot of power. They had it, they held on to it, so they're gonna be able to call the shots. Um, and because they're gonna have the ability to draw these legislative districts, um, they're probably going to draw districts in a way um, that is going to rig the system against Democrats to try to increase their number of votes. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I found this quote um, that you see there at the bottom uh, of this slide. And I thought this was just really indicative of the way um, a lot of politicians think, right? And they, and just and this is openly admitting that I need to give this candidate some more Republican neighborhoods, right? So that is, we know, there's the proof right there. We know that this is the, the reasoning that a lot of politicians use. Um, but 
the problem with, or a, a big major problem with artisan uh, gerrymandering like this is that it basically creates a situation where some people's votes are prioritized over others. Some people's votes carry more weight than others. Um, and right now in this state, you can imagine that Republican votes mean more. Republican voters have a greater voice. And again, this occurs at the expense of Democratic voters, even though there are quite a few uh, Democrats in Kansas. Okay. And if Republicans, you know, again, they already have the supermajority, if they further extend their gains later on down the road, um, they have a really good chance to pass policy that maybe 42, 45% of the state disagrees with um, on really polarizing or divisive issues um, like uh, certain healthcare policies, whether, you know, like Medicaid, um, policies dealing with abortion, right? So it really gives them an edge to pass policies that might not be truly representative of how the people of Kansas feel. And if we look at Topeka specifically, right, we're going to have to keep an eye on how they might divide or cut up Topeka. Are they going to try to throw in more rural areas uh, and break the urban vote, the more urban vote up to where Topeka doesn't have uh, as strong of a voice? That's a very real possibility. Um, it might be the case where Topeka doesn't have a, um, a true representative looking out uh, for Topeka's interest uh, in the state legislature, or maybe not as many as we should. Right? And I would say that that's not really um, unnecessarily democratic. Um, uh, one party uh, systems, one party states uh, typically are not democratic. They're quite undemocratic. So there have been an increasing uh, number of states that have tried to experiment with uh, novel solutions to eradicate partisan gerrymandering. So one of those is a bipartisan or nonpartisan commission. So a bipartisan just be made up of uh, Democrats, Republicans, nonpartisan, right? There's no partisan element to it. Um, and I believe your group does support some version of a nonpartisan commission to redraw um, legislative districts. Um, and I, I commend that um, because it's something that I very much disagree, I mean, I very much agree with, and I don't see many arguments um, that would support disagreeing with it. And I know that our governor has advocated for such a commission uh, as well. And the Supreme Court has even addressed this issue, the constitutionality of nonpartisan commissions. So this is something that Arizona has, um, and it was challenged, and the court said, no, this is perfectly fine. It's constitutional. States can do that if they want to do that. Um, some other potential solutions or remedies could be backup commissions. So if the legislature can't come to an agreement, then it would fall to this backup commission. So if we want to use Kansas again in 2012, right, maybe a district judge wouldn't have had to decide. Um, and then advisory commissions. Um, this differs by state, but really they just make recommendations and then the state can vote to approve uh, of the districts or reject them. And again, those aren't, that's not an exhaustive list of, you know, of all the possible remedies that we have at our disposal, um, but those are some of the, uh, the more popular ones. Um, and like I said, the idea of, of bringing in a nonpartisan commission in Kansas would probably be more democratic um, and it would make people's votes um, mean the same as opposed to the situation that we have right now where some votes are elevated over others. So with that said, um, I would really like to turn it over to you all um, and give you the opportunity to uh, generate discussion, ask me questions, and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, but I really wanted to make sure that I gave you all enough time um, you know, to let me hear your thoughts. So again, thank you very much. And I, I appreciate any, any comments and any questions. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Um, I, uh, we do currently have 51 people participating. Um, I wonder if it wouldn't be uh, best. Uh, do you want to stop screen share or can I do that? Uh, I can do that, absolutely. Um, and then um, if, you, if you have a question, if you want to put it in the chat box, 
or if you want to raise your hand um, in, either in the um, in the participant um, box um, we'll try to get questions addressed um, I did wonder um, can you speak a little bit about the um, the concept of communities of interest in redistricting? Um, communities of interest? Yes. Are we, are we talking about um, racial minorities? Um, well, ethnic minorities? yes. And I, uh, you know, my personal opinion is that uh, potentially in Kansas, it's more about urban and rural. Yeah, so again, being new here, um, I know that Kansas doesn't have uh, too many urban areas compared to, to other states. Um, but, and this might not answer your question, but I do think that there is um, a desire among a lot of Republican legislators to try to, you know, to carve up those urban votes um, and be outweighed by rural votes. Um, if not simply because the fact that, you know, typically speaking, the more rural voters are more Republican, the more urban voters are more uh, Democratic, uh, at least as a trend. Um, so hopefully that, that, did that get a little bit of your question? And Stephen, I am, uh, I'm not sure, uh, I guess Marty uh, responded to that. Um, but again, I'm not sure. I just know that they couldn't come to an agreement and the uh, U.S. District uh, Court kind of forced that on the state. Yeah, so that kind of, uh, the court case that I was talking about, there were a couple of them. Um, so the Supreme Court has applied that concept of one person, one vote, two states. Um, but for whatever reason, they've said that the legislative districts in each chamber, the House and the Senate, are different than the legislative chambers in, uh, in Congress. So when, I believe it was Georgia, tried to give uh, Senate representation based on counties, right, and give counties equal representation, uh, the court said, no, you can't do that. So even in the Senate, it has to be based on population. So they treated states a little differently. But again, those court cases, that was uh, Gray versus Sanders and then uh, Reynolds versus Sims. The Gray versus Sanders was when they tried to make, uh, that was 1963, when they tried to uh, give counties equal representation uh, in Georgia. So our state Senate is based on population. Yes. I, well, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, it should be, and if it's not, then that can, that can be challenged in court. Um, but yes, those, uh, those uh, Senate districts should, basically represent about the same number of people. For example, um, you know, Shawnee County, um, you know, you, you couldn't just give them the same number of state senators as you would, um, I'm still trying to learn my Kansas geography here, um, some county way out uh, in the far, you know, far west of the state. That wouldn't be fair. Well, you, you probably know that part of the issue in Kansas is that uh, the majority of the population uh, lives in the eastern third of the state. So. Yeah, um, really, right? It's just it's, it's Wichita, Topeka, and the Lawrence, uh, Kansas City area, right? That's most of the population. Five counties. Yeah. 
Was that you say five counties, Dennis? Correct. And that's out of 105? Uh, yep. Um, oh. So we have a question. Um, um, if states are the only level where partisan Jerem um, had disappeared on me here. Uh, yeah, so if states are the only only level uh, where partisan gerrymandering can be comp controlled, um, would that require a constitutional mandate? Um, it would certainly depend on the state. Um, it might just be a matter of the state uh, legislature passing a law um, that basically um, forbid partisan gerrymandering um, and then establish through legislation um, a nonpartisan or bipartisan commission. Now, in some states, it might be easier to try to get something on a ballot, uh, you know, where voters could themselves vote on it directly. Um, but you could go a couple of routes with that. Um, either leave it to the voters themselves, put it on the ballot, let them directly vote on it, or have the state legislature um, pass a law. That's a good question. Again, they could take a couple of routes. Um, geography should, uh, play a role, right? Um, there shouldn't be any districts to where they're not connected. Um, but you can really, you know, start making some funky looking districts um, as long as they're connected. And, and we see that all over uh, the United States, the state and the federal level. So in Kansas's case, right, um, it would probably be up to the, uh, the legislature, though, which I would say, you know, Right now, it's not some, you know, hold your breath. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so is the nonpartisan legislative research department, is that Kansas has something like, is that? No, they don't. So this is in Arizona. Yes, we have a research department. Yeah. So the suggest some have uh, suggested that they're the you know they should be the ones uh, that have the say. If I'm hearing that correctly. Yes. I just think that you know in the, in the current political climate, especially with Republicans you know, maintaining that supermajority it's really hard, you know, to give up power. And if they think they're going to lose power at all, and they think that establishing a uh, nonpartisan bipartisan commission or outsourcing it to some kind of nonpartisan uh, panel or listening to a nonpartisan legislative research department, that there's just really no appetite for that. Um, so it's, I guess it's just an unfortunate uh, situation. Um, but maybe uh, voter education uh, is something that you know could could turn and sway public opinion on that. Um, but like I said, there is a growing trend among states to adopt something different uh, than just simply saying, "All right, state legislature, do your thing." As partisan or as political as it's going to be. Uh, um, in in the instance of Arizona. Um, I, I can't remember if it was the legislature uh, that passed the law or if it was uh, the constitutional amendment. Um, and as um, one, one of you pointed out that Kansas doesn't allow for the ballot initiatives, and I guess that route again would be the state legislature. Yes, I, I think that uh, Stephen is, is exactly correct. That's exactly the situation that we're in. Um, and Evelyn, a little more, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't want to be overly cynical here, but yeah, that's true. E except um, the state Supreme Court, right? They can, they have the ability to strike down legislative district maps, but not congressional maps. Um, so at least there's some kind of check. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, politicians are 
very much known for for dodging questions and uh, prevaricating uh, and trying to uh, not give you a real answer or stick to certain talking points. Um, so when, what would you advocate for the League of Women Voters um, in terms of, you know, the less represented the general public feels, the less they are to, you know, apt to participate in mm -hmm. civic life. So um, what kind of advocacy activities might you um, encourage? Yeah, so you're exactly right. Um, and Evelyn, I, I want to say yes, that it has to be approved the state legislative district, at least my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, um, so um, Vicki, you're right. The political efficacy is very important. Um, internal and external. So if people think that, um, uh, I have not read that, but if people think that their voice is, is, like you said, is not being heard, that they're not being represented, um, you know, they develop this sense that, you know, like you said, what's the point, right? It's not going to matter. Um, I have, I have no say. Um, and that's, it's really hard to combat that kind of, uh, fatigue and the, just this general, um, you know, indifference that people can develop. But I think that, you know, groups like yours, and it's always, you know, it's always very nice to see um, politically engaged citizens and politically engaged groups, um, groups like yours going out and uh, doing things like this, um, trying to talk to people about issues, trying to get voter registration up, um, and even showing people if they're just small gains, these incremental gains that, hey, we're, you know, we are making progress, right? And if you are really um, dissatisfied with where things are right now, where they stand, right, nothing is going to change. There's going to be no possibility of change if you don't do anything. But at least there's a possibility, even if it's just a modicum of change happening, if you do participate. Um, so... One of the things I think about uh, from the most recent election, um, presidential election, was a state like Georgia, right? To where if you would have had a lot of Democrats just say, oh, we don't have a chance to win the state, you know, there's nothing we can do, then Georgia wouldn't have gone. Um, the same thing with the Senate races. Um, so having gains like that is definitely going to, uh, you know, energize um, those voters. Um, but it is hard to, uh, to start from scratch. Which again is why I think that your group is is, is so important. Um, I don't think that anyone has to sue Grace. And somebody, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't want to be. The last thing I want to do would be spreading, uh, you know, misinformation here. Um, but I think it automatically is just sent to the to the Kansas Supreme Court, at least from my understanding. Um, first time. Well, I think one of the things that, you know, I, I was really impressed with um, the increase in mail-in ballots and that we, you know, were used all over the country in this past election. Because um, I'm a big advocate of anything that can increase turnout, right? We're, we're in a democracy. Um, um, there are some Right, that want to reduce turnout or limit it, but I'm certainly not one of those people. Um, but there have been calls to, you know, try to figure out if we can vote um, securely online, right, which would again expand the opportunity for a lot of other people. Um, but I think there are other marginalized groups that we don't necessarily think of um, in terms of their inability to vote. Like, yeah, we see voter ID laws passed, um, which in my opinion, certainly have a racial uh, component driving that. Um, but also, if you think about the homeless population, people that you know don't have any ID at all, um, you know, they're certainly affected. Um, how we correct that? Maybe the government sends everybody a card, but how do you give those to people that are without homes? Um, those are things that I think about. I think we all should uh, um, consider. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not familiar with that 400,000 number. I think that's something that you would know more than, more than I. Um, but I mean, that is a, 
very uh, considerable uh, number. So again, it's always good uh, to get you know, as many people registered as, as possible. Um, one party likes that more than, than the other. Um, but again, just from a argument that's pro-democracy, it's good to make sure everybody has their voice heard. Um, and we're not trying to silence people's voices just because we might not like how their vote's going to be cast. Okay. So yeah, I think that experimenting with, with voting online is certainly something that, um, you know, we could make secure, but you can imagine a lot of the arguments against that, right? It's, people were talking about voter fraud with mail-in ballots, even though there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud. Um, you can, again, imagine what people might say if we tried to allow people to vote online. Um, that's a really interesting uh, question, um, Susan. I haven't heard anything like that, but I do know that there are certain states, and you guys can tell me if Kansas is one of them. I know Alabama, where um, I'm originally from, they are not. Um, but there are some states, whenever you go to renew your driver's license, you are automatically registered to vote, which I think is, is a great idea. Um, I would ask, I'm sorry, go ahead. I might, I might just interject about, um, you know, any legislature that would introduce making it a felony to carry a mail ballot uh, for your neighbor um, is uh, not really very attuned to voter registration at birth. No, I, yeah, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's a shame, but yeah, you're right. Um, um, so I have not uh, taught a class that specifically focus, focuses on Congress or redistricting, but in my American Gov class, um, we do talk about gerrymandering. So we go into great detail about that. Um, and students, for the most part, you know, kind of agree with that common sense approach of why not draw these to where they make sense geographically instead of making them, again, look like a salamander or something like that. Um, because again, it just defies common sense and there has to be a partisan element uh, to get that done. Um, so Congress is not typically something students are, you know, very eager to cover. Um, now, when we go over campaigns and elections and I show congressional campaign ads, um, that always gets a lot of laughs because we find some really good ones, um, including, again, from my home state of Alabama, which uh, I think every Republican that runs in Alabama has, they have to have a gun in their campaign ad, so they, they won't let them uh, air it. Um, but yeah, so students, I think, overall uh, respond well to the idea of having some kind of uh, nonpartisan or bipartisan commission or panel. Um, I think that, so cities are, are so different, um, and I, I'm not sure whether it's, it's by population, maybe one of, one of you could help me out here, um, but I don't think that they're subject to nearly as much scrutiny uh, as you'd see at the, at the state level. Um, and again, I think that, that would be up to the, uh, the state. Um, because the federal government doesn't really get involved in local government since local governments are inherently a creature of the state. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, unless there's pro uh, protections in the state constitution, a state could come in and dismantle a city. They could force cities to integrate. Um, they can take over operations. So in a lot of cases, again, unless they're protected by the state constitution, um, local governments are kind of at the mercy of state governments. Uh, and the main reason state governments do uh, delegate that power to local governments is because it's less of a headache for them unless they, unless they have to worry about. Um, that's a really good question um, and something that I'm interested in. So I'm definitely going to look into that, see if there's any data on that. So um, are you referring to Seal's question about the percent of students registered to vote at Washburn? Yeah. It, it yes. might be helpful to the discussion to kind of summarize the question that you're responding to. So. <laughs> I understand. Um, 
just trying to make my way through these, but I'll try to be. Yeah, sure. Clear. Um, and thank you, Mary, for, uh, you know, the, the city council districts uh, must be equal in population. Yeah, and I think you're right that they, at the local level, they do have more latitude. Um, simply because it probably doesn't generate as much interest. Um, and people don't understand how much they're affected by local governments. Um, but they are affected, obviously, every, every single day. Um, but you know, if you look at voter turnout in local elections, um, as, as you all know, it's, it's extraordinarily low. Is there, is, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any kind of questions that uh, kind of go beyond redistricting, go beyond uh, um, voting, um, if, if you wanted to run anything by me. Can I ask you about a criteria for districts? One person, one vote seems to be a, a basic one. Um, contiguous territory seems to be at least partially useful. Uh, they have to be equal in population. And yet the states are apparently allowed to do gerrymandering Do they have, do those states then have to abide by any of the other criteria that has been set out by the Supreme Court? Uh, so you're right, um, it has to be contiguous, right? Um, has to be as equal uh, in population as possible. Um, but there are, you know, and, and they can't racially gerrymander, but there are certainly ways that they can, they can get around that. Right, so if they're just lumping all these Democratic or Republican voters together, right, in one district, so they won't be spread out and win multiple districts, most of the time they're perfectly, um, that's a perfectly legal thing for many states to do. Um, so as long as they're following that basic criteria, the one person, one vote, um, contiguous districts, and making districts uh, drawn in a way to where they are. Um, you know, as equal in population as possible, they have uh, quite a bit of, of latitude there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Tricia, uh, my work in the department, um, as Vicki stated earlier, I, you know, I started in August. Um, my interview process began the week that everything shut down with the pandemic. So my trip here got canceled. So I did everything like this, um, all my interviews, I mean, my interviews, all my meetings, everything was, was via Zoom, um, and then didn't get down here until July. So again, my specialty is in American politics, mainly behavior and opinion, um, but I do teach state and local government here. I teach public administration. I'm working with Dr. Bob Beatty on revamping the public administration major right now. I taught a constitutional law class uh, last fall. Um, it's another thing I'm very much interested in. And this semester, I am teaching state and local American Gov and public administration. And the spring schedule, we know how it's going to look. Um, I'll be teaching an upper level course on, um, um, it's going to be political identity and polarization. So it's kind of going to examine partisanship, uh, social identity theory, ideology and things along that line, uh, things along those lines. Um, and if you're interested, I actually had a, um, a lot of my research focuses on the same types of things. Um, I had a, res had a research paper published in the Journal of Social and Political Psychology um, in 2019 that dealt with uh, tolerance toward hate speech and how that can be manipulated based on uh, party cues, what your party leaders are saying. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, I'll, I'll you know, have a shameless plug uh, for that paper. Um, so can I'm sorry, you, go ahead. Uh, can, you give us a, can you give us a short course on um, some of um, 
some of what that research found? Yeah, so we picked, um, that's an interesting word, I'll get back to it. Um, we picked two issues, um, one that should be pretty offensive to uh, Democrats slash liberals, and another that should be offensive toward Republicans slash um, conservatives. So we uh, took the issue of flag burning. So we had a picture of somebody burning an American flag. And we asked respondents how they felt about it. And then some respondents saw where a Republican defended it. Others saw where a Republican uh, was opposed to that speech. And others saw where a Democrat was opposed. And others saw where a Democrat supported. And the same was true on the other issue, which was the drawing of uh, there's a cartoon of Muhammad, uh, prophet in Islam. Um, and we base this on the different moral foundations that um, liberals and conservatives have. Um, there's a really good book out there if you're interested in this uh, by Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. Um, it's called the, uh, the, the Righteous Mind. And he basically establishes this framework uh, that shows that we, you know, it's not that one side is completely immoral and the other side is moral, you know, vice versa, vice versa. It's that we just emphasize different types of moral values. And what we found was that, in fact, Republicans did become less supportive of the, you know, drawing the Prophet Muhammad if Republican leaders condemned it. And Democrats became less supportive of burning the flag if Democrats opposed it. Right, so those party cues did work. Um, um, and a lot of the research on, on partisan influence suggests that everything from our perceptions of the economy um, to Supreme Court decisions to, um, uh, you know, trust in government, all that is affected by our partisan meanings and what our partisan leaders are telling us. Um, so, you know, that's, again, that's a very, you know, that's it in a nutshell, um, probably not doing it service, um, but I am on ResearchGate, um, if anybody wanted to check that out. Um, I co-authored that paper with a professor at Ole Miss, uh, Dr. Julie Ronsky. Um, try to look back. Um, Sil uh, King, uh, do I think that the U.S. Senate can hold a trial? Um, it's, I guess I would say it's constitutionally murky. I'm sure you have legal scholars that would disagree on this, just like any, anything else. But I think that if, if they did, um, you know, hold, hold a trial against them, the best you could do is just make it where he can never run again. I mean, that, that's the ultimate outcome. That's the desired outcome is to make sure he can't run again. Um, And um, so, uh, Trisha, you said uh, territories, right? So I guess the main one that sticks out is uh, Puerto Rico, right? And have y'all been paying attention to the, uh, the push to basically make Puerto Rico a state? Yeah, I, I would argue that that is, you know, it's 2021, the idea of having territories, uh, at least in my humble opinion, is a little outdated. Um, so while they are American citizens, they have the same rights, right? They don't really have the same voting rights as we do. Um, so I would say, you know, either let them go or make them a state. And I think that um, Puerto Ricans have made it known that they would like to become a state. Um, and I think that there's not really too many good arguments not uh, for making them a state. Um, some better arguments for not making DC a state, um, but not so for Puerto Rico. Uh, but I, I, I'd be surprised if we don't see a push uh, among the Democratic Party to try to make uh, both of those states. Um, and we'll see how much support there actually is for that. So in the few minutes that we have left, um, I would invite you to unmute yourself and uh, ask any other questions. Um, uh, yeah, Grace has reminded us that the League of Women Voters dev, does have a position in support of um, uh, statehood for Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, there's a very solid argument to make for that. 
um, especially in terms of representation. Um, I know that those on the opposite side would say the whole point of having DC not be a state was so that it's not, um, you know, it, there's not, you know, a state that has a certain advantage over our nation's capital, right? Um, it's not controlled more by one state than another. Um, it can remain more independent. Um, so, I'm mean, again, I, I'm not saying that I'm opposed to the idea, but I understand some of the arguments against it. Um, but yeah, the um, to to get to Grace's point, the yeah that the response was uh, just absolutely uh, disgusting. It was it was delayed, um, it was weak, um, and quite frankly, um, they should have known better. Um, it wasn't really a surprise if people have been paying attention to all the chattering on social media and things like that, um, and with um, Donald Trump's rhetoric whether it be uh, on Twitter, um, well, you know, which he was banned from, or just in his rally um, when he told people to go wild. So yeah, that the police uh, were very delayed and um, they, they did not respond well. Uh, Sharon, it's very nice to, to meet all of you. Um, and again, I really appreciate um, you having me here today and giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, I hope I answered your questions uh, at least somewhat coherently. And, you know, I do hope that you all will have me back again um, to have another chat. I'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we do appreciate it. And I do appreciate you stepping in because Dr. Dickinson, who was originally scheduled, had a conflict because Washburn decided to go back to class schedule in person. And um, so we hope to have both of you back. Um, so I want to remind everybody that um, the recording of this program will be available on the li library website very soon. Um, and plan to join us not only on February the 16th for the concurrence meeting, but um, on March the 2nd, um, again for Virtual Tuesday Topics, where our speaker will be Dr. Bob Beatty from Washburn, and he's speaking about Politics 2021, the good, the bad, and the horrible. Um, so, um, if there's nothing else for today, um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. So, thank you very much, and thank you again, Dr. Armstrong. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Bye, everybody. <laughs>